Hi, everybody, and welcome today. I am really excited to introduce Dr. Bumi Abawaba. She is an internationally renowned and globally certified food addiction coach, as well as the founder of the Food Addiction Academy. She's authored a number of books, including The Business of You, A Simple System for Self-Care for the Burnt Out Female Entrepreneur, and Craving Freedom, The R4 Method for Overcoming Food Addiction, which was a number one seller on Amazon. If you look her up on Instagram, you're gonna find her under The Food Addiction Coach, and I am so excited to have her here today. I'm Heather O'Connor from O'Connor Family Law. So, do, do I call you doctor? <laughs> No, just call me Bumi. That's easy. All right. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for taking your time to be here and talk with everyone today. One of the things that, you know, I know from my experience and from speaking with other people is everyone has a story behind the passion that brings them to where they are. Could you talk a little bit about your story and what brought you to where you are today? I would call it the Anos Horribilis, which was the, the worst year of my life was 2008. Dental surgeon by profession just meeting kind of life on life's terms at the time you know very busy with two children you know I was one of those that kind of worked excessively hard and um, I kind of have an addictive personality anyway so you know work hard play hard and it got to the point where I kept burning out I kept burning out I actually didn't understand I just thought right let's just keep going and just keep burning out and I would have to have time off and then I'm back in and not getting any self-awareness whatsoever of you know what was happening with me from a very young age I always had this different relationship with alcohol with food um, when I was young uh, I was a latchkey kid my parents went to work uh, I used to let myself in probably from the age of seven or eight my parents would always leave a snack before they came home and cooked dinner but I would always have that snack and then I would I've done my homework and then I would be back in the pantry kind of sneaking stuff sneaking cookies sneaking chips um, but it was a very furtive kind of hiding behavior. So that behavior started quite young. And when a lot of people probably look back, if they have some sort of condition, you know, whether it's food or alcohol or anything like that, then they can maybe go back to their childhood and actually start joining the dot. But I found that that was something that was a definite behavior pattern that was unusual and the alcohol kicked in probably about the age of 12. My parents, my family aren't big drinkers whatsoever. My mother introduced me to a glass of wine and from that day I knew this was my best friend. <laughs> it was the clouds kind of cleared, the sun shone, everything I felt very confident. I was very much an introverted sort of child and for me it was that was lovely. And I would go down and again, you know, when my parents were asleep or something, I'd go down every so often, not a lot at the time, but just go and sneak alcohol. So this was my pattern all the way through. My behavior was very much a bit secretive. It solved, seemed to solve problems. I felt good. I'd be studying and then I'd have a little drink or it'd be food. It was either one or the other. Sort of got into sort of teenagers, into the twenties when I went to start to go to university and um, it became a bit more profound. So I found major life events the alcohol increased or the way I dealt with food increased I went through a period of what we say binge eating and bulimia um, where I'd make myself sick that was very much again um, around exams so it was always those milestones where it got worse and I managed to kind of be a sort of high functioning I wasn't really drinking too much and it started to take off and again it was life events it just took off I would start binge drinking this is when the consequences started by that time I was married with you know two very very young children and I just couldn't stop I couldn't stop and I would say and I would say for that for me it was a fall down seven stand up eight scenario I went into seven rehabs in about seven years and it was the last rehab where I, I came into final recovery by that time um the consequences were a DUI um divorce papers were served fight for the custody of the children professional bodies were alerted through my drink driving uh so all the all the consequences all the things that i never ever thought would happen happened uh and that's the power of alcohol you minimize everything you're in denial um and you know i nearly died so coming out of the rehab it was i've got all these things to face um i actually didn't want to come out i wanted to stay but i had to had to you know deal with life and I knew I had to deal with it. Oh, it was a biggie. It was a biggie and had to get as much help as I possibly could. So 
AA, the fellowship was brilliant. And I really do recommend that. And that kind of saved my life. But I wanted to kind of explore more um, into why I kept doing what I was doing, because there was very, very, it was very much like I can do it on my own. I can, I'm, I'm a strong enough woman. I can do it on my own. I don't need any help. That was me for many, many years. And then I finally realized, no. And this is when I got vulnerable. This is when I asked for help. And this is when I started working a program and doing what I was told. But then there was more to it for me. And I thought, well, there's something missing. There's something missing in me that keeps me doing what I'm doing. And that was a real self-awareness and a a journey of discovery, really, in my recovery. That's 15 years ago. But what it took me to was finding the holistic avenues of helping myself as well. And also the mind, body and spirit is a threefold illness. And that's one thing that I forgave myself for was it wasn't me being uh, self-inflicted. It's a disease. It's a disease which, you know, can take you right down to, you know, death. So I kind of forgave myself with that and started to really work on me and, you know, what it is that drove me. So I unpacked a lot of things with therapists, counsellors, but then I started doing going the holistic routes. So doing a lot of things like meditation and mindfulness, Reiki, that kind of thing. For me, my biggest thing was just discovering myself and not doing it for other people, um, not doing recovery for mm-hmm. somebody else. And I'm not doing it for my profession or my family or for to get back on somebody's good books. I had to do it for me. And all the time before that, I was always doing it for some other reason. And again, looking outside of myself. And this time it was like, right, no, this is for me. This is really, really for me. Um, and that's my journey. And then I just felt very very passionate about it because there's so much ignorance and stigma out there and that's why for so many years I never really and I was very high functioning nobody really knew until the very end you know I kept it I was achieving doing extremely well but deep down I was you know a shell on the outside I was very confident and on the inside I was just this broken person nobody really knew me and I was scared you know and Mm -hmm. as years went by I just you know it was almost I tried it was hard work you know, keeping up that front. The inside did not marry the outside. You know, there was two two very, very different personalities. The bummy there that's kind of struggling and the bummy that's super confident. Um, so for me, I knew that when I spotted it in, you know, my own profession and people would sort of say to me, could you, could you help? Because I, I started to talk about it, that if I can talk about it, there's somebody out there who's yeah. sort of said they've got the same story as my, you know as myself and you know this is when I started to help other people became a recovery coach started to get very well but again I was noticing even though I was in recovery from alcohol it was the food so it was switching again it was switching so again I had to nip that in the bud and you know you can cross addictions whether it's food work you know shopping sex anything you know it just switches so for me you know I wanted to help other people you know, did a recovery coaching course, went on to do food and noticed food was a big one. You know, I thought it was just me again, um, but food is massive, you know, more than it's under the radar. So, you know, people who are addicted to, to food, um, as far as I'm concerned, it, it that is an addiction. And again, a lot of people say that's not an addiction. It is because it, I felt exactly the same way around alcohol as I did with food, mm-hmm. you know, and I've always said if it quacks like a duck, you know, <laughs> flies like a duck it's a duck addiction's addiction and years later it is now being coined food addiction and that's something back in 2008 2009 I said it just feels exactly the same I'm doing it in, for the same reason um but under that spectrum of food addiction are it's binge eating bulimia overeating you know compulsive eating anorexia is also part of the range so you know you've got a broad spectrum of what food addiction is all about um, and binge eating is the the one that most people kind of identify with, and it's something that is now it's massive. It's massive. So I got yeah. into helping, yeah, um, you know, men and women uh, with you know signs of binge eating, food addiction, and again the massive shame around it, and and mm-hmm. you know, and it's linked to trauma as well. So it's two very very fascinating feels that kind of joined together for me and that's why I decided to yeah make that my my kind of life's work and I think it's so interesting and you've touched base on it of when you go through something that is so difficult um whether that's addiction whether like for me was the divorce and you know a lot of the things that I went through throughout that it 
many times can leave you feeling very hopeless and yeah. like you're the only one that could understand what you're going through. And I think it's so important, you know, to, to look at you, to look at other people who have come out of a situation and then utilize that to help other people understand that it can be better and not only better, you can, and, and I believe this was actually something like this, very similar on your website, where it was, you, you can take a low and utilize that to not only make things better, but to completely turn things around oh, and yeah. create something fantastic. Oh, and absolutely. And that's so, what I think to, to, to so many people is that it's not the end, it's the beginning. And it's the beginning of a second, second life, a life that you can create now in sobriety, whether it's from food or alcohol or any other addiction, and really take it to the next level. And I talk, talk about taking it from limited to limitless, that you you are, once you've got that freedom from addiction, your life can just take off. So I always give that person that hope that that is, that is where you're going. It's not just, I always said if recovery is going to be boring, I wouldn't have been doing it, you know. <laughs> it's got to be, there's got to be something after that do you know what I mean yeah. and so life beyond recovery is it's very very special very very yep. special and, and I think it, there's a couple other things that you just talked about that I'd love to touch base on um one you know you talked about being a latchkey kid and through that you know potentially what I'm hearing from you is kind of turning to food and alcohol maybe to make up for that emptiness you were feeling yes. now where we do divorce and custody, we deal with a lot of obviously broken homes of people who, you know, with how much things cost nowadays, you can't have a parent who's always staying home and either the child's in childcare. So there's a lot of situations where a child is going yeah. to be left home alone. Absolutely. As a parent, you know, what can parents do to help their children make sure that they don't fall into those patterns? Well, I think the first thing is let them know that they're, they're loved. Um, for me, as a latchkey kid, I mean, my my parents were very, very good in some respects that they were calling me regularly when I was at home on my own. But giving them um, like a little routine, um, being able to connect with maybe other children, whether it's, you know, neighbours, you know, see if they can be with neighbors or friends or relatives so they're not always on their own all the time but give them things that are entertaining for them to do like coloring or you know kind of just giving them something but limiting their time on their own um many children sort of get on I got on I was very good on my own that was not the problem the problem was I'd disappear into books and whatever and then I'd stop you know, sort of eating and whatever, but just giving that love and compassion and letting that child know that they're, they're, they're loved. And, you know, that the reason why they're having to work is because, you know, financially, that's, the, that's the way, you know, it's going to be, but it's, it's a difficult situation. And I think it's talking to other members, maybe talking to parenting groups, you know, what is the best, you know, way to do this, and there may be groups that come together that are in a similar situation where they can, you know, swap things like childcare. And so a lot of people look at others who they consider to be successful, where for you, your dental surgeon, a wife, a mom, you know, you had a life that a lot of people would look at and say, oh, she's got everything. What, what do you have to say, one, to people who might make those assumptions and then compare that to where they are and feel like they're not good enough? And then two, you know, other people who are in those exact same shoes and where you've said that, you know, there, there's a stigma almost that goes into that. What do you have to say for people who feel like they have it all, but inside that they don't? You know, what do you have to say to those two groups? Well, number one, I mean, one, the first one was the, um, let's cut that a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pause that a second. Got that, so Caitlin, we're cutting, we're, we're going back. Got that one. <laughs> so what was it? The first one was who's got it all. And then the second one is, the second one yeah, was. Yeah, and I, I, I can break position. down the question. Let, let, me re, let me redo the question yeah, so that that way yeah. we can do it. Yeah, yeah, cool. So, 
there's a lot of people who look at people who are successful and they think, wow, they have it all. And it's easy to compare yourself, you know, where in your shoes, you are a surgeon, a wife, a mom, someone that people would look up to and then compare themselves and think, I don't have that. One, you know, how, what do you say to people who are thinking like that? Okay. Yeah. I, this, that's a very, very good question. And I always say, don't judge a book by its cover. That's number one. You actually don't know what that person's going through. For someone to say maybe who's financially not as advantaged, they may think, oh, they've got loads of money. You know, they're comfortable. They're great. But again, they could be struggling as well with money because they've got, you know, they have debts. They have financial commitments. Sometimes the more money you have, the more responsibilities that you have to you know, me. So that person may still be in that a financial stress, even though they are, you know, they looking financially abundant from the outside. And also everybody, ha we're all human. We all have our fears. We all have our insecurities. You know, look at the most amazing, you know, stars on the, you know, the planet who are going through the trials and tribulations like everybody else. You know, that it doesn't mean that the person is comfortable and, and happy and everything's harmonious. There's just higher, probably, you know, bigger problems to solve in many ways. So I would say don't judge a book by its cover. And and everybody is is human and we, we can't always judge and say, yeah, they're all right. So that's yeah. number one. Love it. And then for people who are in those shoes where they recognize, hey, I've got it all. And, you know, the first person who still pops to mind is Robin Williams, you know, mm -hmm. somebody who you look at and their job is making you laugh and making you feel good, but there's desperately something wrong. You know, what do you have to say to people who are in the position where other people are looking at them saying, wow, you've got it all, but they're struggling? How, how's the, or, what is the best way for them to reach out to help for help and to acknowledge that they're not alone in that? Yeah. And again, it goes back to feeling like you're the only one mm -hmm. um, because you don't talk about it. You no, know, really nobody really talks about mental health as uh, they are more now, but mental health and addiction was something that you just, you just try to cope with on your own. And that kind of still stands a bit today. And it's about getting vulnerable you know, that situation where I could have died, I had to get vulnerable, I had to go and reach out. And it was, it's getting rid of the ego that everybody thinks I'm strong, you know, I can't break that I can't show people that I'm weak, well, weak, or, or, you know, just, it just, it, it, at that point, I just had to go out and go, I need help, because I knew it was going to kill me. And mm -hmm. it's just really important for people in that position to say, yeah, I'm human again. I'm human. You know, that part of me needs that help. Getting vulnerable is the strongest thing that you can ever do. And you're not mm -hmm. losing face. You know, you're not losing face. As soon as I went into rehab, I thought it's just me. Everybody was in the same position. You know, very successful people, more successful with the celebrities in there. They, they just as vulnerable as everybody else. And it's, it's, yeah thanks, I'm surrendering. I know now that I'm in the, you know, in the right kind of group and I feel safe. And, and it is that, that fear of not feeling safe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who do I show that to? And if I show that to them, then will I completely lose face or will I not be successful? And it's, that's not the case. There's a part of you that needs healing, you know, and, and let, people let support groups let therapists let whatever you need to do you know just do it by any means necessary so there's no loss of face there's no loss of status by doing that um, yeah and i think i think it is a hundred percent you know something that people really the more people talk about it and yeah. share you know not only what they're going through but what they're doing to to move forward yeah i think you're you're going to see more people start to open up about it because you know even we look at instagram tiktok facebook 
everybody puts out like this perfect life. And then you have everybody looking at everybody else going, you know, everything for them is so great. And then I have, and there's this comparison and it's not fair. And I think not enough people express the downside as well. But mm. I think with expressing the downside, it's important to have a positive outlook on that. You know, how yeah, do you right. how do you share it in a way that is showing you moving forward? Because yeah. that also, you know, I I found for me when I'm struggling with things, sometimes just sharing that and talking to somebody else about, okay, this is how I think we can move forward, and this is what we yeah. want to do. That all of a sudden makes me feel better. Yeah, so, absolutely. absolutely. And I think that's, that's it is sharing the positives that, you know, sharing that this is what, this is what life can look like if you follow a particular program or you did a particular thing and you started exploring. And, you know, as I said to you earlier, you know, life is, so, is a hundred, just my life 15 years ago compared to now, complete difference, absolutely different woman altogether you know, I never felt good enough. I never felt like I was enough. And this is a very successful person mm -hmm. saying that. And I'm sure many other successful clients of yours who are going through the same situation may still feel the same. I'm not enough. You know, I'm not intelligent enough. I'm not financially, you know, better off. I'm not this. I'm not that. And it's that hole in the soul. It's that thing that just needs to consume anything from the outside to make you feel better, albeit temporarily, you know. So that is the most important thing is to look at, you know, let's let's sort that hole in the soul and let's move forward because I'm doing things that I never thought I'd, I'd amazing stuff. I've met the most amazing people. You know, many men also rejig their careers that might change their life paths. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is what I really want to do. So kind of realigning yourself, realigning your true self, your what we call authentic self. Because a lot of the time we're working from, you know, values that, that aren't ours at all. Right. Um, and so getting getting vulnerable, getting truthful and honest, you know, drop the arrogance, drop the ego and get the help that you really need because people are out there to help. Yep. People are out there to help. And I want to touch base on where you talked about high functioning and, you know, when especially especially successful people who are high functioning addicts whether it's substance abuse whether it's alcohol whether it's drugs whether it's food you know work i tend to say that i'm i'm addicted to work yeah. <laughs> you know so whatever it is a lot of people again look at them as very successful and they might feel as though I need to do this in order to be successful and this is what has helped me get to where i am Mm -hmm. What can you say about the process that somebody would have to go through to break that feeling of I need this in order to be where I am mm -hmm. to be able to be at that same point or more without the addictive behavior? I think for me, it's I mean, I'm talking from my own perspective. That it was I'm a dental surgeon. That was a label. And what will happen if. I lose my profession, mm -hmm. what would happen, you know, and that was very much because of the DUI, you know, it was reported and well, thank God it was, to be honest. Um, so what will happen to me if I kind of lose my profession, which I didn't thank God, but what would happen? I, I, I'm then nobody. That was almost like I'm a nobody then. I'm no one if I've lost my profession. And I really, this is where I needed the support and go, look, you're still for me, you know, you're still an amazing person that, you know, these labels aren't anything to actually do with you spiritually, you know, mentally or anything like that. And it was that just separation of ego to work on me, mm -hmm. to become something more. So it's kind of like reverse engineering that you have to work mm -hmm. on yourself to kind of then go back out there and go, yeah, I'm still great at what I'm doing and maybe I'm going to do something different which is even great and I think it's just unpacking you as a person and and realigning it <laughs> um you know to feel whole again and that's it mm -hmm. you feel it wasn't the dentistry wasn't me it's what I do yep 
And I think for anyone who's struggling with addiction and, and ha- as huge as successful, what they're successful at isn't them. It's what they do. Yep. Yeah, and I agree with that. What, and it's because what they do, and they think the more I do that, the more that I'm validating myself, but you're leaving yourself more empty because you're thinking, well, if I don't have that, who am I? So it's getting to know you again. It's going back to basics and getting to know who you are. What are your beliefs? What are your truths? What is your vision? What do you really want? And sometimes those wonderful, fantastic, successful things they're doing is probably not what they want to do, but it gives mm-hmm. them that kind of validation to the outside world that they're successful and and, and this is what I do. So I'm yeah. just saying it's going back to basics again. It's always going, keeping it simple, going back to basics, you know, and who you are, what your truths are, what's your vision for yourself, what do you believe, what are your beliefs, you know, that and all yeah. that and, and rebuilding really, unpacking and rebuilding again you know, to a better person. And and what would you say? So this comes up frequently within the divorce and custody world where people will be together and one person drinks more than the other. So it might be that one person doesn't really drink at all and the other person drinks a lot, but they say they don't have a problem. You know, at what point, because I know even for me, you know, there's times where I go out with clients or or networking, and there's usually alcohol involved. Mm -hmm. And I remember my grandmother saying at one point when I was younger, she said, when I started looking forward to that glass of wine at the end of the day, that's when I knew I needed to be careful because that was what was getting me through the day. And that that hung with me because of the fact that addiction does run in my family. Mm -hmm. But what... You know, there, there's points where I do drink every single night, you know, whether it's out with clients, out with my husband, out with the social engagement. And I step back and I go, whoa, 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 you know, am I doing too much? And it also, as I was saying, it arises in custody cases where somebody might drink, you know, three to four beers a night and there's no issues, there's no anger, there's no anything, but the issue comes up within a divorce that oh, they drink too much, so I want the kids. At what point should somebody start questioning, do I have a problem, even if it's not affecting me? Because that that line between, you know, somebody's going out and getting drunk and DUIs and fighting and they're aggressive, that's easier. Mm. But when you're high functioning and for all per for all intents and purposes you know nobody would look at you and think you have a problem yeah what are some of the self analysis that somebody can do to say is this a situation where i should be looking for some help right okay yeah there's there's various scenarios with that i think the first one is as you said you're when you're talking about your drinking it's very much occupational And you've got that self-awareness, maybe just kind of rein it back, but it's occupational more than anything else that you're going out with clients, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's a case where you're looking forward to that drink, Mm -hmm. like in the evening, and and you need it. And you've gone from a, 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 the brain is amazing. Neuroscience is amazing. Mm -hmm. And the brain goes from liking something to if it's consumed a little bit more regularly to wanting it Mm -hmm. needing it and the person will just have to kind of examine if they really want it if they need it needing it means come heck or high water i'm going to have that drink at the end of the day so that's a little tester that's Mm -hmm. a little tester is you know can you if you're finding it your head's starting to go oh my goodness i'm going to have that drink at the end of the day or that drink in the afternoon Oh, oh, there, it gets scary. I need that drink before I even go to work. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's when you start to kind of question it. Can you have a drink, one drink, and then stop? And many who, you know, through the progression of alcoholism, one's never enough. The first drink actually sets what we call off the phenomenon of craving, where one drink will set you off on a on the path to a bottle, two bottles, whatever, binge drinking until you cut you come through or come to um and can you have that first drink and then you just stop and what i mean just stop i mean don't think about it just get on with your life and everything else or is it always in your head and i call that Mm -hmm. the mental obsession 
So that mental obsession is like that drink's there, that drink's there, I've got to have it. So it's that that mental obsession, I think, is the most important sign. I know we talk about cravings, um, where I really, really, you know, that's more with food than anything else. You know, you're craving a drink, but it's more the mental obsession. It's like, go and have that other drink. Go and have another one. So start to kind of just sit back and be aware what your relationship with alcohol is. Is it, is it a need? Is it, oh, it's just a, you know, a sip or two. Heavy drinking is heavy drinking. But when you get into the alcoholic state, that is when you, you're just constantly thinking about it all day long and when you can have it. You know, uh, yeah. that's the most important one is the mental obsession around it and what we call the phenomenon of craving. Once you have that first drink and you swear off, I'm never going to have it again, and then you're off. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. it can be certain situations, stressful situations. So we're looking at triggers and and then it's primary coping mechanism isn't going for a walk or doing a meditation or kind of calling a friend it's going for that bottle mm -hmm. oh, it's going yeah and i remember it, i recently had a conversation like this with somebody where it was like well why can't you just have one drink and the response um because they grew up in a very social drinking, you know, mm -hmm. neighbors would get together at the end of the night and they'd just have drinks. So that yeah. was just what they did where I came from a different background and it was like, well, why would you just have one? Why have any then? Yeah. And that that's kind of falling in line with, I think what you're saying, but I think there's also a difference of what you're used to in your environment and yes. you know judging people as well so it's it's this very fine line where i think yeah it I is think a fine people line. really need to look at themselves again so. that's it's, it's going back to the self-awareness that you know if mm -hmm. it's becoming a problem if you're starting to have consequences mm -hmm. having blackouts you can't remember what you've said you may have rung somebody up during the night and they think can you remember what you said to me uh uh, uh no um, so it's looking at the little consequences that start creeping in, um, forgetting meetings, um, going off early on a meeting, calling a meeting and, and ending it because you want that drink. Mm -hmm. um, little telltale signs, but it's things like blackouts, it's feeling of nausea, maybe shakes, you know, mm -hmm. not sleeping very well, you need a drink to get to sleep, you know, and that's a false, that's a false sleep anyway. Um, mm -hmm. drinking in the morning, you know, and going for, you know, and it, the tolerance level going for more and more and more, and you're still feeling very much the same. I need more to drink. And that's the thing with alcohol is that you need more to achieve the same feeling. And you never, yeah. ever get that first feeling back, that, you know, that first wonderful feeling when you had your very first drink at the age of 12. I could never, <laughs> ever get that back. But that is what people with addiction to alcohol try and recreate is that first feeling and it's mm -hmm. called a phenomenon of craving so it's very very powerful but it, again it's just a huge amount of self-awareness yeah and testing it out you know maybe I'm not going to have a drink for a week well how do I feel so just to kind of journal or you know note down how you're feeling every day are you feeling mm -hmm. more irritable you know you're feeling more anxious again anxiety comes in that they need to have the drink to kind of allay the anxiety so all these little mental you know health problems start to come in anxiety then feelings of panic you know you're getting panic more panic attacks again the mm -hmm. more you drink the more you're susceptible to panic attacks um mental you know fatigue brain fog all of these and are there certain, or have you found uh, through your work, through your studies, are there certain factors that would set somebody up to, to you know, let's strike that because I'm not saying this question, right? <laughs> Within your, your work and your research and your studies, have you found that there's underlying factors that make one person more susceptible to an addiction than another person? And yeah. if so, what are some of those? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, that's why I said to many who are, you know, going through, you know, getting well, a lot of the time it is, it's, it's not your fault, um, but we can take responsibility. But things like trauma, trauma is a big one. Uh, trauma, either mm -hmm. physical, verbal, sexual, from childhood and a young age, 
the way uh, familial, so, you know, a, a parent, a, a family member, um, alcohol, food issues, they may be alcoholics or, you know, have food, you know, addictive eating behaviours. So, again, it could be genetic, uh, how they were brought up, again, um, psychological factors, that's a, as that's a biggie, biological, environmental Mm-hmm. You know, all of those peer pressure, social pressures, you know, perfect, perfect feeding ground for alcoholism, you know, all of those. But definitely trauma is a very big one. Yep. Which divorce often is. What, is what, um, what type of advice do you have for somebody who maybe in the past has struggled with some form of addiction and then they're moving forward and they they understand and because some trauma you don't know what's coming at you but when you're in the midst of a divorce you understand that that's a pretty earth shattering event what are some of the things that people can do to help protect themselves from falling back into those old habits during a traumatic period well yeah i know because i've been there <laughs> i've been there um, and i came straight out of rehab I was I was served divorce papers in rehab, so I was coming oh. out into that. Yeah, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I laugh at it now, but and hopefully everybody there, you know, in your community will be able to kind of look back and laugh and think, yeah, that was a moment that marked the beginning of recovery. But um, the first thing is if you've you've if gone through a program or some sort of uh, process, whether it's a counselor or therapist or 12-step program and and you've done that before then it's it's to go back into that again to really regroup and and do all the things that you did you know to get well and double it Mm -hmm. and double it and I've always said you know going through this is a chronic stress divorce is a chronic stress it's a chaotic it's unpredictable you don't know what curveballs are coming at you. You don't know what papers are going to come through, what documents. So it's very much, um, again, going back to neuroscience, you're back into survival mode. So for many sort of alcoholics and anybody in general that we we still we work from that kind of survival, the old brain, the kind of survival instinct that oh, the fright and flights is is running, the chronic stress is running. So our decision making isn't the best sometimes because we're in fright mode a lot of the mm-hmm. time. And that can be for both parties, you know, people who aren't addicted, the spouse is not, the spouse that is, but it's more, it's amplified in somebody who, you know, has an addictive pattern. Um, and again, it's that it shuts down what we call the prefrontal cortex. That's the decision making part of the brain. So it's the old brain that's at work now. So this is the, the, the addict's brain that's in there that's going right so things like decision making goes down it becomes more impulsive and then so you you, you're primed to you know you absolutely number one prime to pick up something to self-soothe to kind of get that brain self-soothing pattern you know into established again so again if you're prone to alcohol it'll be that that'll be a primary coping mechanism to kind of soothe whether it's food for some people it's shopping gambling um Mm -hmm. internet porn all that kind of thing so we know that you know chronic stress that is definitely going to increase impulsivity decrease this you know proper decision making so the person the individual the client who's going through this needs to now really seriously go back into whatever program they they were doing Mm -hmm getting the support, getting their buddy system um, there, uh, going back to AA or whatever it is. A lot of self-forgiveness as well, I think, for both parties. Um, A lot of forgiveness, a lot of compassion, a lot of kindness, a lot of self-care, and really get into that routine. Again, the brain likes routine. So, you know, maybe setting up a really good daily routine a weekly routine of what you're doing getting out going for a walk doing some meditation doing some journaling speaking to a buddy every day you know who understands what you're going through but not enabling you Mm -hmm. um be going to your group if you need to 
gratitude, I think, is really, really important, no matter what's going on. You know, be grateful for what you have around you at the time. You know, and it could be the roof over your head. You've got a bed to sleep in. You've got food on the table, all the simple stuff. So really get down to simple brass tacks uh, so that you're grounded in the here and now. It's so easy to fly off in your head and second guess what's going to go on in the divorce and, you know, catastrophize, really. Whereas it's just a day at a time and recovery is a day at a time, but also mm -hmm. the divorce as well. And be very kind to yourself, very kind. Don't beat yourself up, you know, but that's why you, your support circle will, will do that for you if you are. I mean, I've always said that, you know, my support circle kind of loved me until I could love myself, yep. you know, until I get to that stage where I could love me. And so, you know, that client may be going through that kind of self-hatred. What have I done? You know, this is all my fault. And again, just recognize it's a disease. Recognize it's a disease, but you have the responsibility to work on it. And the most important thing I said to myself when I was going through my own divorce was recovery comes first. Yep. Everything was flying at me and recovery had to be number one. Yeah. And I think, I think it's important, you know, just in case there's any lawyers out here, di divorce lawyers who are watching this, I think it's so important to realize, you know, your client's past and what they might be struggling through. Because yeah. I remember I had a case where the, I was representing the father. It was a custody case, not a divorce, but he had, you know, been an addict, had recovered and had over 10 years of sobriety under his belt. But then, you know, with with a custody case often comes allegations, you know, everything comes up. And his case was really bad. Like there was a lot that was thrown at him and he he succumbed to the pressure, you know, and he started drinking again and he he fell off the wagon and completely basically brought everything that he was being alleged of to, to fruition. And I wish, you know, as a practitioner, I wish I had known more at that point. As soon as I heard that he had sobriety and he had a struggle in the past to make sure that he got that extra help to support him through everything, yeah. mm -hmm. because that would have made a huge difference in his yeah. case. So That's I think it's very right. important to be aware as practitioners of what your client is going to be dealing with because it's not just the fight in the courtroom there's so much that goes on underneath and behind the scenes yeah. that if you're not setting clients up for that extra support you're you're not doing your job properly so i just wanted yeah. to point that oh, out that's too brilliant yeah no that's absolutely brilliant i think you're one of the first lawyers i've heard sort of talk holistically about a client and it really, yeah, I'm absolutely blown away because it, it has to be, it has to be holistic. It has to be a 360 degree. We're looking after this client all the way through mind, mm -hmm. body and spirit. And what are you doing? Have you got your support system checking in, you know, and, and giving them maybe some, you know, sort of a little checklist of, mm -hmm. you know, have you got your support circle back? Are you speaking to somebody every day? Are you eating? you know, that three meals a day, you know, are you making sure that you eat? Are you doing something each day that's life enhancing, like going for a walk or playing golf or, and just making sure and just checking in with them or they're checking with you, maybe it's a quick, you know, email, quick, whatever I'm doing it and just ask them to, you know, check in with their sponsors or whoever they're with, but also, you know, making sure you know what their plan is you know, mm -hmm. whether it's weekly, monthly, because this is, it's a long, it took me months. I mean, my, I was in the marital home for 12 months through that divorce. And I had a spouse that wanted me to drink again mm -hmm. and would put a bottle of vodka in front of me and go drink that and do anything in his power to, to make me have that drink to say, yep, she's drinking again. I'm going to have the kids. She's out of the house. So I know what it is to go through a divorce, but go through it sober. And mm -hmm. these things will be thrown at you and, 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 you know, you'd be vilified by so many, but you have to stay in recovery. It doesn't matter. You know, everything else will come, but yep. you, if you lose your recovery, you've lost everything.
Right. So I think for a lawyer, I think it'd be absolutely wonderful that they are aware of this and that they have, they work with their strategies. They know what they're doing. So at least they're getting, they, they know they're also getting support from the lawyers, not just the legal side, but, you know, holistically as well. So yeah, well done. I love it. Well, thank you. Um, now, changing, turning the tables a little bit, because I know you are on the addictive side, and it sounds like your spouse was pretty vindictive and wanted to use what you were going through yep. against you. But what would you say to someone who has an addictive spouse and they've wanted them to get clean, they've wanted them to, you know, embrace sobriety, they want to have that that yeah. wonderful life that doesn't involve the addiction, but you can't control other people just because they you want it for them doesn't mean they're one wanting it for themselves or two able to take the step to to make things better uh -huh. at what point should somebody just go back i'm going to start that part again come on what would you have to say to that spouse the one who is struggling with the question of do i stay and keep letting it happen, even though it doesn't seem like they want to change? Or do I move forward with a divorce? And I, I'm leaving out people who are vindictive and want to use it against the person. I think they're in a different category. But for the people who are really struggling with somebody that they love with an addiction, and that question of do I stay or do I go? What, what type of advice would you have for them? For me, it's number one, get support. First of all, you know, get educated around addiction, whether it's going to something like Al-Anon, which is, you know, spouses, children of, you know, addicted, you know, spouses, to get that support and, and really get listening and start becoming aware of other people's stories will give you an idea and also you can't you can't make somebody <laughs> get well mm -hmm. and and it's a case of they have to want to get well um so in many ways the person who's not addicted the spouse who's not addicted is kind of powerless over that situation and it's up to that other individual if they want to get well they'll get well because that's when real healing begins you know, you can't make somebody say if they don't want to go to programs, then the other person that's invested maybe in the marriage is, you know, what's life like in five years time if this carries on? How safe is it? Mm -hmm. You know, how safe is it? Then we're talking about children. Mm -hmm. What are they witnessing? Do you want right. to be always driving them to, you know, sports or school festivals because you know, that the other spouses have been drinking or drugging. How safe is it for you? What trauma has been caused so far? What are the consequences of, of staying in that? You know, and it's weighing up the pros and cons. And sincerely, if the person's not wishing to get well, then seriously, then it's maybe a temporary separation until mm -hmm. they get well and bring back. Because there is still love there. Um, you're not dealing with the, per the, the person that you you married. You're dealing with addiction is like a completely different person. I was a completely right. different personality. You know, I was not the rational, sane person that I am today because of the addiction. So you, you're dealing with somebody who's not really rational. And it is, again, it comes down to how safe it is being with mm -hmm. somebody. But making right. sure that you have that support, you know, your family, your friends, maybe the physician maybe it's church, that you have a good, you know, trusting community that can support you. And then sometimes I think the decision makes itself. Yep. And I think that unfolds with time and the decision will be, yeah, I either stay or I either go. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's very, very difficult because that person still, yep. you know, is if they're having that, that, that decision, you know, they're kind of having that dilemma, then they probably still love that person. 
but that person's kind of disappeared for the time being until you know recovery or yeah. not um so it's a difficult well, and that's have, but we sorry we we do get a number of calls where people are really struggling whether again whether it's addiction whether it's a spouse who has cheated on them maybe more than once um and they're really struggling with do i stay and and support them and try to help them change versus do do i leave you know do i do something that i feel is going to be better for my life and it, it's a very very difficult situation it and is. it's one that your divorce lawyer is never going to make or should make yeah. you know that that's yeah. up to you but um i think it's so it's important that if you're struggling you reach out to help for you know people like you who are willing to and to help talk about you know what it what is it that one you can do to change or change your expectations um so in those I situations think, don't call me call her yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I, think, I mean there's various things that can be done like an intervention stage of intervention whether it's family mm -hmm. or friend at stage of intervention or you get professional stage of intervention but as i said the, the person that has to also take a step back and reevaluate what are their values what are their beliefs what do they really want is the codependency in this relationship you know right how how toxic is this relationship to me you know have mm -hmm. i become the caretaker you know for this person so again it's all about again it's like the flip side you know right. they're both having to really kind of do with what what do i want what do i really believe in you know am i staying because i want to fix this person am i a fixer <laughs> right Yep. Um, you know, am I being codependent? Do I like to feel that I'm always, get, you know, looking after the underdog? So there's a lot of reasons why people stay in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So that again, that has to be impacts. That may be again seeing a therapist separately to to see what they want, and then creating those boundaries. Yep. You know, and this is where boundaries also help make decisions. Mm -hmm. Um. You know if that person has really good boundaries like you know i'm going to make sure i drive my children you know that person's drinking um i will drive that person to appointments but nothing else i'm not going to enable them standing back from arguments you know when the person's under the influence mm -hmm. self-care is very important really again it's that focus on self-care and that's you know that's important self-compassion and then you can kind of look at it once all that's in place and kind of go is it worth it mm -hmm. yeah and i think those those are the those are the incredibly important questions to be asking yeah so i want to i want to switch bases a little bit or focus and talk about food addiction um, yeah. We don't see this come up too often as an argument in family court. Usually the more addictive arguments involve drugs and alcohol, but it is something I, I read an article that said one in eight people over the age of 50 struggle with some sort of food addiction. And I think it's something that is so easy to fall into for a number of reasons. You know, and I know even within my past, I was a figure skater. You know, I moved away from home to train and every week we had to get weighed in. And if we did not hit our weight, oh. we were given a toothbrush and told, go back to the bathroom and oh. come back when you make your weight or you can't get on the ice. You know, oh. and there, there was a lot of pressure. I myself turned to laxatives for a while. I think it's another thing not enough people talk about or they're not talking about it unless it's an extremely severe case. And so growing up in the figure skating world, similar with gymnastics, ballet, there is a lot of eating disorders. Yeah. So Massive. what it is, are those statistics accurate? You know, is it approximately one in eight or, and is there different age categories? Because my, my belief is that food addiction doesn't care how old you are, doesn't care the color of your skin, doesn't care what sex you are. Absolutely. It doesn't care about any of that. No, um, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. So and it's and it's again like with any addiction, it's non-discriminatory. 
you know it's it, it doesn't matter as you said what what you know where you're from etc cetera, etc cetera. and food addiction runs right through the ages i think what's what really important with food addiction is when they're talking about people over the age of 50 i think we're looking at menopause menopause mm-hmm. can actually trigger addictive eating behaviors food addiction and we kind of don't talk about it as much we don't talk about that that age range as much as say a young adult or an adolescent where it's anorexia bulimia whatever and now it's becoming into our awareness that there is disordered eating in you know kind of later years as well so i think that's what we're seeing more of is that you know there is addictive eating patterns which are set off by hormonal changes hormonal imbalance in the 40s perimenopausal menopausal so it's it's reported more um Mm -hmm. and i think that's really important to, to to realize that and things like adhd um, or ADD, you call it over the, over in America. Again, that's linked to food and, and addiction. So again, all these things are coming out that we, we never knew of you know, years ago. But yeah, it's definitely runs across the board. And so what, what exactly, you know, for somebody who's just tuning into this and hearing food addiction, how, how do you know if it's a difference between Hey, I just love a cookie. You know, I I love sweets. I love cake. I love this stuff versus that addiction that you have to break. Right. Very similar. As I said, for me, I ate like I drank. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's once I had one, I couldn't stop. So once I had one cookie, one Oreo, the whole, the whole packet would go and some. And I would go out of my way and go and buy some more and eat it until I felt full, sick, uh, pass out. And it was a preoccupation. So from the minute I woke up, and again, as I said, when I stopped the alcohol, it was the food that kicked in. Um, I'd be thinking about what I'm going to be preparing, eating. And it had to be certain foods. It was particular foods. It wasn't necessarily lots of apples or, or lots of whole real foods. It had to be ultra processed foods you know the combination of fat sugars and salts which sets off a massive dopamine surge that feel good transmitter dopamine serotonin is another feel good transmitter these are all in ultra processed foods so anyone who's listening if you are feeling compelled i think is the word like you're driven at knife point to kind of consume a whole cake in one sitting or a whole packet of 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 biscuits, donuts, that kind of thing, there is a problem. Um, mm-hmm. And you can't put them down until you, as I said, you, you've either run out of money, or it's, the, the, it's all gone, the shop has closed and you can't get any more. Um, mm-hmm. that, is, that is food addiction. And to the point where you're, you're physically you know, harming yourself, so there's consequences. Now, everybody kind of talks about obesity, Food addiction runs right through the spectrum of weight, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's how you feel, how it makes you feel, what it changes in you, you know, to make you feel good for a short period of time. That's that's a classic sign of food addiction, that kind of feeling good. And obviously you're going to get the massive crash afterwards, the withdrawal. Then it's back to binge eating again, you know, food addiction there's a lot of shame and guilt with that as well because you can't mm-hmm. again you can't stop another classic addictive sign you can't stop uh and then you'll say you'll swear off and you go i'm not going to do that again i've known clients throw things in the bin put you know washing up liquid detergent all over it and still take it out of the bin and eat it because that's mm-hmm. this is so that's the extreme but it is kind of the furtiveness again around it your behavior around it hiding it from family, putting it in drawers in your bedroom, kind of hiding it. You've got, it's like having a dummy for children. You have dummies everywhere. It's like with food, you've got, you've got your little storage areas, your little secret places. So it becomes secretive, hiding, stealing, um, you know, swearing off, swearing on, you know, completely preoccupied with, with that particular type of food. And we call them trigger foods. Normally, as I said, ultra processed foods. Some people have addiction to volume of food so it could be volumes Mm -hmm. of 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 food so that's another addiction um but again you you'd 
there's a lot of shame and guilt in it. There's a lot of, you know, you feel like you're lying to your family. Then people start judging you, you know, do you think you're eating too much again? So again, it becomes more of a furtive behavior. Um, mm -hmm. So if anybody has any of those signs of, of that, or they just can't put it down, the sweat, I'm going to have one slice of cake and it just gone in five minutes. Yeah, that's, that's it. And you're doing it regularly. It's not just a one off. You can, mm -hmm. you can overeat, you can overeat, you know, you can like, yeah, I'm going to have it all oh, great, 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 great. But if you're doing that kind of regularly, three, four, five times a week, or you're constantly grazing on packets of things, then yeah, you have an issue. And where you've said trigger foods, are there certain types of foods that lead to that addictive behavior that you've seen? Or is it really dependent upon the person? It's dependent on the person. Um, some people like sweet, creamy textures, um, and they'll sort of go for the, the ice cream, tubs of ice cream. I, that was one of mine, a whole tub of Hagen darts every night, you know, and some other things. It would be, you know, tubs of things. It'd be um, nutty, crunchy, like, you know, chips. And again, that's ultra processed food. Again, so that Moorish feeling, that crunchy, nutty, yummy, that's that's nice. You can have more of that. Men are more kind of savory, nutty, crunchy. Women are more kind of, you know, sweet, creamy textures. So, yeah, there's, there's, everyone has a particular preference. Okay. And is it similar to drugs or alcohol where you go through recovery? Is it that you can never have those foods again? or can you learn to have them in moderation? What What's the recovery process when it comes to food addiction? Everybody is different. But I would say, and it's, again, one day at a time. And I never project right into the future and say you can never have this again. You know, it's let's see what this day is like. Let's see what the next day is like. Let's see what the mm -hmm. week and the month and whatever and see so where we go. So recovery with food is kind of a gradual thing because food's everywhere alcohol is is different because it's it's that kind of all or nothing mm -hmm. whereas food is a much more complex thing it's much more right. complex you can't kind of walk into the shop and you know kind of avoid looking at all these trigger foods they're all there in your store but for for recovery for somebody who and as i said everybody's different you have to assess the individual but we always start off with, yeah, let's abstain from these particular foods because they're not life enhancing, number one. And when we talk about abstaining and some people kind of go, I, I can't, you know, I can't have this ever again. I never, never say never, right. never say never. But, you know, just for today, just for this week, let's plan on just abstaining from these things. And when you're abstaining from these things, the advantage of it is, you know, the, the absence of carbohydrate hangovers the absence of guilt and shame. These are all the wonderful things that you get. And, and I always say there's thousands of wonderful, gorgeous, tasty things that you can eat, you know. Um, so, but it's bit by bit by bit. And because if somebody is on good recovery with food, the brain changes, you know, the brain starts to kind of habituate to normal levels of dopamine. And because of the disciplines, and the strategies that I put in place, it almost becomes placing that person in a position of neutrality so that they may go to a function and there may be a cake there, you know, and a year later and it'd be like, I don't need it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no struggle anymore. And that's the same with like, for instance, alcohol that, you know, I've been placed in a position of neutrality where I can walk into a party and not have to think, oh gosh, there's alcohol here. What are, what are the 10 things I need to do to to not meet, having to drink. So it's a case of getting that person to such a state kind of mentally, you know, and the neural pathways have changed again. And normally after about 12 months, the neural pathways have changed to kind of a, you'll never become a normal, you know, I'll always be, you know, dependent on alcohol. If I, if I picked up a drink today, I'd be off. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that for, I know that for a fact. And again, that's the self-awareness, getting to know yourself. But that person who today may say, oh, my God, I might never have that that slice of cake again, will get down the road and kind of go, I actually don't need it. I'm not bothered. I'm doing other things. I feel great. Um, right. So just see how it all unfolds bit by bit. 
And do you do you find that, you know, I think with the majority of people now, if somebody said, look, I'm an alcoholic or I was a drug addict, I need to stay away, there's more of an understanding of that where I think people still would look at food addiction as, well, why can't you just have one piece of cake? Why can't you do this? Yeah. And especially when you're going into holidays, you know, or events that are very focused on food and drinking yeah. and, you know, everything Absolutely that right. could trigger you. What, yeah. what are some of the things people can do to protect themselves specifically in those situations? And also, I guess this is a two part question because I'm really good at asking those. Oh. What, <laughs> what, how can people help explain to the people around them that this, this is a real struggle and I need your support? I think that's from the get go. And that's what I, that's the first thing that I teach um, my client is let's look at the boundaries straight away. Um, because we don't need to be doing exp any explaining after that, that, you know, your nearest and dearest, your support circle, this is what's going on for me. You know, I want to get myself into a good, you know, sort of mentally, physically, emotionally, because it's again, it's a threefold, you know, issue. And will you support me on that? And if someone's going to, you know, a client of mine is going to an event, et cetera, they ring in first. You know, we have the pep talk. Um, they may have a little bit of something to eat, a little bit of protein, something where they're not going to be ravenous. And I always say this, when you go shopping and you have an issue around food, um, really have something to eat first before you go shopping, <laughs> then you're not shopping for the wrong thing. So you, you, your brain is in a very in the prefrontal cortex so you're not in the hungry mode where you're you know you're ravenous and you reach for all these things so it's again it's managing so managing your stress levels you know do I actually really need to go to that event right now I'm early in my recovery or yeah I'll do that probably I'll, I'll reevaluate. maybe in three months time I'll go to that event again or if I go to the event I'll just ring ahead and just see what's you know what food is available you know what foods can I eat that's available there and maybe you'll be going with your spouse or whatever, and they can actually, you know, get the food for you, um, you know, and, and do it that way. So there's really, really great ways of making sure that you, you know, don't fall into, you know, kind of binge eating, you know, compulsively mm -hmm. eating and the strategies kind of going through your program, doing your breath work, journaling, you know, why am I doing this? The why is very important in mm -hmm. any recovery why am i doing this that has to be compelling and by the way i am a future life practitioner where we kind of go into our future selves and look for best future self and see where they are so that that is a great why that crystallizes your why um so all these kind of come into place so that you can go into an event and feel confident and the event's not just around food it's about great conversations it's mm -hmm. about family it's about friends it's doing all of that and by the time you've had you know a good time and talking to people and everything and you've had your plate of food that's maybe you know been handed by your beautiful spouse etc cetera, etc cetera, it's great it's great but it's kind of walking into anything and what is my why why am I doing this and sometimes as I said it's not forever I'm not saying it's forever as in you can't ever do this you might be you know I had this mm -hmm. conversation with a client today that you know, never say never that you might get to that situation where you might just go, oh, yeah, a little slice of cake. That's fine. It doesn't, I'll have it, but, you know, take it or leave it. It's that take it or leave it feeling that I want my clients to have right. um, at the end of it. So, yeah, food's very, very different. But in some extreme cases, it is a case of abstinence. But by the time, again, the brain has settled down, you know, they're enjoying the foods that they have. You know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of types of food you could have that aren't going to set you off in the, what we call the phenomenon of craving and binge eating. So it's just knowing that it's not restrictive, mm -hmm. you know, and what I put a, what a client on is not restrictive either. It's not a diet. That's the difference. It's not a diet. It's a food plan. And it's all the other kind of spiritual things that go around this, you know, to, to help somebody and stress management, that's very important. As you know, it increases impulsivity, chronic stress. So I'm very, very hot on, you know, coping strategies, stress management, 
mm-hmm. breath work, mindfulness, all of that, getting out into the sunshine, just, you know, being present in the in the moment and enjoying each moment, enjoying the day. Yep. Now, obviously, you've written a book on the R4 method in relation to food addiction treatment. Can you give a brief explanation or summary as to what exactly that is? Well, the R4 method was, I mean, it's kind of my own journey. It's based on kind of what I did. And it's about finding a relationship with me, number one, relationship with food. What is my relationship with food? Why am I doing what I'm doing? So it's creating that awareness. That's R1, relationship to self, relationship to food. You know, why do I do what I do? Uh, Why do I eat the way I eat? Um, So that's R1. R2 is reframing. So that's kind of reframing how you feel again about yourself, um, about the the world around you. And we talk about negative thinking, positive thinking, cultivating a positive body image, um, self-worth. So self-worth and self-esteem, which is kind of with most people with addiction is pretty low. Mm -hmm. And again, I was just going to go back to high functioning, successful people with addiction have can have very low self-esteem but you wouldn't think it so it's cultivating a kind of a sense of self-worth r3 is resilience so again we're talking about the coping strategies um because you know life is life you have to deal with life on life's terms but you need the coping strategies to arm you you know to make you feel that you stand in your power that you can can move forward without having to pick up a drink or having to pick up that food and then recovery that's the last one or four that's maintaining it you know what do you do to prevent relapse um and relapse all normally starts from when you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing anyway it happens a long way before an event um so when somebody said oh i've relapsed you know this event happened this life event happened then i'll say what did you stop before this mm-hmm. event in your mm-hmm. in your journey and you usually find they've stopped most of what they were, were doing in the program and so relapse is the end result of not doing what you're supposed to be doing to help yourself so r4 is all about relapse prevention and i think i think that's so great because not only is all of that applicable to food disorders the the thing that comes to mind is when i was coming out of my marriage which had turned abusive. And when you're going through something like that, you often become the person who tries to hold everything together and you lose your sense of self when you have children, when you're in that sort of situation. And all of that, you know, rings true for each situation of finding your wife, finding, you know, ways to move past that. So I think, you know, your R4 method extends even past absolutely yeah food. i was gonna say it, that it, it's a light it's bigger yeah it really, <laughs> it's, it's it really is for everybody it is for everybody i've always said that even about 12 step programs it's for everyone mm-hmm. you know it's for everybody so everybody will get a benefit from it and it really does get you to kind of look at yourself and look at the, your, your own thinking and your own awareness and your own things that you need to improve within yourself um, and mm-hmm. then i also say it's Anything that happens around us, just start from what's going on for you. Yep. First of all. And then you also you also focus on helping entrepreneurs from experiencing burnout as well. Can you talk just briefly about that and you know a tip that you can give somebody who is really fighting to to build a business, to build, you know, a company that they they've envisioned it's very easy to get into a situation where you experience burnout. So what, what type of tips would you give somebody like that? Well, yeah, so it's, again, everybody's different, but mm-hmm. again, hugely successful, highly creative individuals um, have less of a filter. <laughs> <laughs> Big creators aren't as grounded, I would say. Um, because they're the the big picture personalities, big vision and everything else. So a lot is going on in that person's head. So again, we're having to kind of get that person back to ground, you know, getting the support systems really back to, you know, what's happening for me again with all of this. How do I need to stay well so that 
you know, everything that needs to take off can take off. So it's again, grounding the person really, I do quite a lot of energy work with, with my clients, you know, getting them grounded, getting them back into their bodies so that they can, they can actually manifest what they, you know, they're, they're looking to, to manifest and be successful in. So that's the most important thing is doing that, but also helping them to make sure I think it's interesting that as entrepreneurs, it's easy to be also start grappling in the business rather than on the business. Mm -hmm. So it's helping them stay on the business, but stay grounded and getting the people who have the superpowers for all the things that they actually don't want to particularly do and keep, you know, their creative selves, you know, at the core. And that's the most enjoyable bit. But again, you know, they're more prone to addiction. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yep. Because they're so out there, that's on more prone to addiction. So again, it's back to basics, back to simple, back to self. Love that. Yeah. And so how can somebody get in touch with you if they've been listening to this and they say, you know, this is something that I really want to work on and she seems fantastic. What is the best way for somebody to reach out to you? Right. Okay. So I have two two (laughs) this comes into two kind of businesses that i have um so if you're looking for your why if you're looking for what is my best future self to move towards then it's www.yourfuturelife.co.uk and there that's where i deal with the food the alcohol and and future life progression then my other one is called the food addiction coach www.thefoodaddictioncoach which i deal solely with uh food and addiction and so even though you're in the uk you can work with pretty much everyone correct yeah yeah i mean i um, normally online or i fly out for instance so it's 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 what works so but that's something that's a bespoke package but mostly online Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again so much for sharing some of your story, your background, Aww. tips for everyone who's watching today. I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot. I hope everybody else out there has. Aww, so you, make Martha. sure you you find us on Instagram. I don't know. Are you on TikTok? I've just gone to TikTok. <laughs> All right, so she needs some followers there. So hop on. Yeah. What's your TikTok? <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So she can stop that there. Was there anything? (laughs) That was a great job. Is there anything you want to touch on that she can go back and edit in that maybe we didn't talk about? Or I think it's the future life progression. I think that's for me is that's something that I discovered. I'm an advanced future life practitioner. Um, and it's amazing for people. This is something that I think is very important for crystallizing somebody's why for recovery. Okay. And this is for me- also, but this is for anybody as well. Anyone who's going through a divorce, they kind of lose mm-hmm. their sense of self. You know. And who okay. Let I? me let me I- stop you here. I'm going to ask you specifically about that, and you can just you know answer. Oh, wow answer however and she can go back in and make sure we get that in there oh brilliant okay thank you so you are an hold on advanced future life practitioner (laughs) so you are an advanced hold on now now i feel pressure that i'm gonna have to say it right (laughs) hold on let me put my paper right in front so i can see it (laughs) so you are an advanced future life practitioner what exactly is that and what do you do with it oh (laughs) this is my piece de la resistance heather this is what i love it and this is something that i found i wanted to kind of something that was the icing of the cake for my coaching for my clients Mm -hmm. and it's something that i well i don't think i stumbled across it i think it was just divinely timed and um i was speaking to a lady who because i'm venturing also into working in Dubai in the Middle East etc and this lady um, has a lot of clients in the Middle East and I was just chatting to her one day and she talked about this is what she does and I thought what is that and it was goosebump moment it's like this mm-hmm. is perfect this is this is the PS de la resistance for my my clients and this is where we go into it's like a it's like slight hypnotherapy kind of a light trance state 
and, and going and finding their best future self. So I guide them. So it's a pioneering dynamic tool which helps a person discover who and, and where they're going to be in the future with future life progression. So just imagine I'm sort of guiding, you know, you, your best future you, the best possible imaginable future you. You get to meet your best self and you get to retrieve, receive the messages from your future self and bring them back. So this is what I do. So you can look at things like, okay, recovery, you know, love life, what is my new soulmate, what is my career path, health, wealth, your creative genius ideas. This is great with my creatives as well, finding your creative genius idea, finding your future home, all of those things that I do. But this was amazing because of recovery. I just thought it was brilliant. And it's a way of really getting that essence of what is going to happen in the future if you took a particular path. So what would be for you if you were in recovery, you were sober? Oh my goodness, I might have a different profession. Oh, it's a profession that I really love and I'm living in this location instead and whatever. And what is your future self asking you to do to get there? So it's basically foresight rather than hindsight. Mm -hmm. so, it's really about, so it's really, really exciting. There's not many of us in the world that are doing it right now. But it is fantastic. I've had an Emmy Award winner um, had this done uh, two weeks ago with me. And it's, it's it has blown, yeah, he's blown his mind and he's started. And it gets you on that path of purpose. Mm -hmm. And it kind of lights you up. It, it kind of does. There's a perceptible shift in my clients. And this is, this is giving me a why. This is giving me a future. This is giving me hope. And yeah. then we talk about, day, you know, um, especially in recovery, talking about a day at a time, but you do need that hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that well, and I think problem. I think it's it's so important as well, because a lot of people can't see that future, you know, and it's hard for them to envision what it looks like. So it's very yeah. difficult to build a why. Absolutely. And, you know, I know when I was building my business, when I was changing my life, your why is your foundation. It's it's everything. And when you have that future that you're talking about, you, because this is the other thing I believe, when you have a strong why and you have a path that you're going to, you see doors opening for Absolutely. you that you might otherwise miss. And Boom. if you're always looking for that, those doors are just going to fly open where okay. other times you might have those blinders on yeah. and you don't even you see that there's doors there. So yeah. I, I, Nail on the I, head. Yeah, I think that is so fantastic. Right. And it is, it's almost as thought, yeah, as you said, it's almost like the doors are opening because mm -hmm. you've got that clear vision now. And it's yep. something, and it's just this perceptible shift in time. And then things start to flow. So whether it's recovery or whether it's going through divorce, things start to flow. It is an amazing, fascinating art. Oh, it really is. And I absolutely love it. Absolutely That's that. you gave me goosebumps with that whole <laughs> because I think it's, it. it's something that can help so many people no matter where they are in their life. Yeah, you know, absolutely. having having that idea of where they're going, where they can see it so crystal clear. I think that's a game changer for people. I think it's a crystal clear path, but it's also you can look at alternative futures. Mm -hmm. um, you know. You, what does that look like? You know, we you can really go to town on it and then come back with just, I mean, my, I would say the, the just cut that. I just got really tired then. <laughs> okay, that part's cut. <laughs> cut that. Pause. No, I, right, no, I was just going to say that it's just, right, pause. And what's powerful about it is that we actually, you know, get to see, it's the person that sees the future. I'm not telling them their future. Nope. They're guiding to find it for themselves. And it's usually things that they never, ever expected to happen, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And then they could bring it back and they go, wow. And I've had several clients come back to me and we'll look at five and 10 years from now. And they're actually starting to unfold within the year within three months four months for so some reason for instance, the timeline shift and it speeds things up as well which is amazing amazing that's awesome it? okay 
<laughs> that, that is really exciting though. Like, I'm, glad, I'm glad we talked out. about that more <laughs> because that yes. that is so cool. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. And it is the icing on the cake. And I just, I'm now, I'm doing it for a, a lady I did a podcast for because she goes, oh, can you give one for me? So I'm doing one for her tomorrow. But it's like, I have, I can't, well, I can't tell, well, I can't tell you who it is. But um, yeah, so it was through a friend of a friend and he went, yeah, give me, give me it, give me it because he didn't know what he's doing with his life. And, you know, Emmy, BAFTA, not, yeah, BAFTA, Emmy, um, and so, yeah, I just kind of went through it with him and I was like quite nervous and everything else. And mm -hmm. he just blown his mind. And again, he's changed. He's slightly now changing his career path. Yeah. For what he's well, it, It's really interesting because, you know, I, I came from pretty much nothing. You know, I went through a divorce. I had three kids under the age of six, no money, you know, absolutely nothing. And I remember creating my vision boards with the things that I wanted to be able to achieve on them. And then I hit a time in my life where I achieved absolutely everything on my vision board, everything that I thought I wanted. And then I struggled with, okay, what now? Like I'm yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. What, do what, I, what do I do now? What's and next? how do yeah. I change this where because I mean, of course, money is a motivator, you know, making more money always sounds appealing, but that's not going to push you through, you know, the everyday struggles. And for me, it was changing. Okay. Well, what am I doing for other people? How can I make other people's lives better? You know, how can I, I take that's, this? That's what it's all about. And I think true life purpose, everybody has a gift of helping somebody else. And when you find that true life purpose, which you have, that's when it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. you know, you hold, and that's the same with me that, you know, once I found a life purpose, you know, and it might change as well. You know, yep. you never know in a few more, it might be something else that's, you know, don't have to not set in stone. Then things just open up for you. It's yeah. almost like it's divinely aligned when you're aligned with it all and it feels fantastic and it's passionate and it isn't about money at the end of the day. It's about what you're really passionate about. Then yeah. things start to open, things start to kind of unfold. And and I think, as I said, that that purpose is what a lot of people are looking for, but they kind of don't know it. Mm -hmm. And with future life progression, people actually do see their purpose and that's what lights them up. And that's when things start to unfold. Yeah. And if it's just chasing the money. It's dead. You know, right. Exactly. Mm. Well, I might be calling you. you know. Oh, yeah. No problem. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> because so, yeah, I, and again, again I think it's one of those fascinating things where it, it's not it's not something just for people who are struggling. It, it's no, to take no, no, your no. life to another this level. Is, this is yeah, this is for someone who's like, oh, I'm, I'm bored. I mean, what am I supposed to be doing in my life? I'm stuck in this dead end job. I've got this book of idea that I really like and mm, don't know. And it's like then taking them forward. There's one lady who says, oh, she wanted to, you know, a gallery. She's always wanted a gallery and but she wouldn't know where it is or whether she could do it or whatever. And we took her forward. It was five years, took her forward five years, 10 years. Um, and she saw her gallery mm -hmm. and she could see, she could see, hear, feel, didn't know exactly where it was, the location, but she saw her gallery and how it was set up and everything. Four months later, I got a phone call. She went, but me, I found space to build my gallery. It's exactly what I saw. It's wow. exactly what I saw. Yeah. I found my future home that I'm living in. This is my parents' house, actually, because the internet's not great. But I found my future <laughs> home that way. You know, I found my future home because I was living in London. And then my parents, my dad's not very as well as he should be. So I thought, let me move back. The boys are at university. And uh, I wanted to find a place in West Yorkshire. And I just could, for the life of me, I couldn't find anything at all. So went through with a colleague, Future Life Progression, and I saw this beautiful white cottage. Now, I've always lived in apartments, Heather. Mm -hmm. So where's this white cottage come from? And I saw it, and it was in the, it looks like it was in the countryside. There was a lake there and everything looks beautiful. I thought, I don't know where it is. I had another session. Then I saw a landmark of my old childhood park. It was a pub. I thought, what am I doing here? What am I doing at this pub? Then I looked, I thought, this is Round Hay Park. Hmm. So I started in my, in my visualization, I was wandering through it, still couldn't find it. Came out of it, Googled places to rent, to buy in Round Hay Park. Up popped the house. <laughs> 
Oh, but I nearly fell off my seat. That, that, that afternoon, it was a Sunday afternoon. I sent a message to the real estate agents. The next day, we haven't got any viewings today. I said, I'm going back to London. I need to have a look at this today. They rang me back. They said, oh, we've got a viewing for half past two. It's cancelled. Do you want to come and have a look at it? Went in. Oh, my good God. It was there. The door. <laughs> I could Because I visualised everything. The layout of the place. Wow. Everything. What was the stairs? The smell. It was newly refurbished. Everything. That was my home. That's, that's incredible. Sub, don't forget the subconscious mind is 300,000, 30,000 times stronger. Mm -hmm. So we are connected to our future. We're connected to our past and we can yep. change both of them. Well, yeah. and I think it, it's, it's not only that, but I think people are very hesitant to change because even if they're uncomfortable, it's familiar and yeah. being able to see what it could be, you know, and feel it and taste it and, and live it in what you're talking about could could likely give somebody the courage to break out of yeah. you know the chains of comfortability. So okay. yeah, but you have to live it and breathe it. And your whatever you vision, you live mm -hmm. it and breathe it as though you, it's it's happening. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sitting in this swanky office right now. You know, <laughs> this is how this is how you bring it in. That's how yep. then it becomes like you you're doing it. You know, as is. Well, I feel like we could probably go on forever. And yeah, thank you again. I yeah, you're, this you're has welcome. been so great. Awesome. I, love what, I just love what I'm doing. I love it. I love right. it. I love it. <laughs> All right, then. That's Take how care. I feel all, most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Aww. Well, thank you again. Take care. You're very welcome. Take care. Bye. 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 <laughs>